unsullied by us humans, sex is a very good part of human life. We live our lives in a great deal of hypocrisy, telling our children to do one thing while we do something else. The quest for control. We all would love it if our lives were a bit more controllable. Discussions within the Christian community about these questions will be primary for the survival of the Christian community. The honor of introducing our first speaker. Now you've heard that from those who introduced speakers before, that they have an honor. But let me put it in perspective this way. Think back to your favorite mentor, supervisor, preceptor, a professor. Do you have an image of someone who really ministered to you and spoke to you and guided you both in your personal and professional life? Well, if you have that image in your mind, you could perhaps understand the privilege that I have to introduce Dr. Vernon Grounds, who was my advisor at Denver Seminary, where he served from 1956 through 1979 as the president of that seminary. Now, I remember attending your advisee group, Dr. Grounds, at 6 a.m. in the morning. I also remember that he served whole wheat bread with the coffee. Now, I didn't understand that. I thought we were being cheated. Somehow, the definition of Christian fellowship to me was donuts and coffee. The other advisory groups got donuts and coffee. We got whole wheat bread. <laughs> Seeing you here today, though, I'm not going to complain anymore about the whole wheat bread you served us with our, our coffee back then. Those were special times because I also learned that Christian fellowship wasn't just the coffee and donuts. It was sharing our love of the Savior with one another. It was sharing our love of the Word. It was learning to grow in relationship with one another. And it was learning to use our minds to think and engage with issues. That made it a special time. Recently, I read an article in uh, Christian Counseling Today where Dr. Grounds was featured as one of the pioneers in Christian counseling. And uh, he was asked by Dr. Gary Collins uh, what his activities were as chancellor of Denver Seminary. And Dr. Grounds answered that question. He said, well, when the board gave him that title, he inquired, what does a chancellor do? What's his function? No one answered. And apparently, that's been his job description for about the last uh, 20 years. <laughs> you may know him from his speaking or writing. Perhaps you use a little devotional guide called Our Daily Bread. You might be familiar with that. If you ever see the initials VCG on the bottom of one of those devotionals, you've heard from Dr. Vernon Grounds. Uh, he still sees clients pro bono at the Vernon Grounds Counseling Center in, in Denver and uh, is still very much active on the campus of Denver Seminary. A couple of years ago, I attended a grand dinner sponsored by the American Association of Christian Counselors where he was honored for his lifetime achievement and contributions to Christian counseling. That was actually quite appropriate because from the time of his dissertation, I won't ask you what year that was, but it was a few years back, uh, when he talked about uh, the work of Sigmund Freud and the concept of love, he was working to glean from the minds of those who are writing, uh, what could be taken from that and used for the kingdom, always looking back to the word of God for a steadfast anchor and direction. And he was doing integration before that word became popular. What brings him to the platform today? Well, he's going to use his background to be introspective and speak with us about his experience of aging. But I have one more thing to say before I turn the platform over to him, and that is that he has taught in the areas of ethics and pastoral care, counseling, and theology. But there's another reason why he's been invited to the platform today. Because a conference like the one we are engaged in, where we'll be working on the issues that are before us, is actually taking place because of some of the pioneer work that Dr. Grounds did many years ago. You might not catch the connection or the change. So let me just, just 
make it a little bit more specific. In 1969, probably most of you weren't around in 1969, but in 1969, he wrote a work called Evangelicalism and Social Responsibility. Now, if you remember back or have heard back or read a history book about what was going on at that time, social activism or making a dent in the culture with the cause of Christ as your motivation was not a very popular endeavor. As a matter of fact, he wrote this. We can and must affirm that the church has the responsibility of nurturing and judging the ethos of our political and economic life. Its responsibility is that of improving the moral climate of society, elevating standards and sensitizing consciences. To say the same thing metaphorically, the church is to be a thermostat instead of a thermometer. It is not simply to register the ethical temperature of its environing society. It is to keep that temperature from falling. Let us confess, however, that through most of its history, the church has been more of a thermometer than a thermostat. Isn't the central thrust of our work together to figure out ways to be thermostats in today's culture? Well, if it is, then I think you're going to enjoy hearing from uh, the man who wrote those words back then. I present to you my mentor and friend, uh, Dr. Vernon Grounds. It was worth the trip from Denver simply to find out a few things about myself and uh, leave with an enhanced self-image. <laughs> my regret is that my wife was not present <laughs> to be reminded of how fortunate she is. <laughs> Some coincidences are interesting. For example, my participation in this conference on aging strikes me as being rather such a coincidence. I'm about to speak on the experience of aging, and July 19 happens to be, I say with apologies to you who are staunch Calvinists, happens to be my birthday. <laughs> so now this very evening, 87 years ago, uh, I am here. I meant to say that the cake was served before. <laughs> there may still be a few pieces left over. I'm not sure about that. Well, this very evening, 87 years old, I stand here as the embodiment of what I'm about to discuss, the aging experience. A creative friend made a plaque which hangs in our kitchen. It's the picture of an aged couple, husband and wife, sitting side by side on an old-fashioned swing. And underneath the picture are those familiar lines from Robert Browning, grow old along with me, the best is yet to be. Was Browning overly optimistic? All of us are aging, of course, second by second, whether we are 40 or 60 or, or 80, wherever we find ourselves on the time life, timeline of life, rather, we must acknowledge that we are growing older. I remind all of us that 
aging is an inevitable process. We can't stop the tide from sweeping in. We can't stop the sun from setting. We can't keep flowers from fading. Neither can we arrest the passage of time, which second by second is making all of us older. An inevitable process, aging is also an irreversible process. We may entreat with Henry Wadsworth Longfellow, backward, turn backward, O time in thy flight, make me a boy again just for tonight, but that entreaty will never be granted. As Aldous Huxley put it, there, there are no back moves on the chessboard of life. In addition to being inevitable and irreversible, the aging process is individualistic. No two humans have precisely the same reaction to the ticking away uh, of the hours. Just as no two snowflakes are identical, no two aspen leaves are identical, no two fingerprints are uh, identical, so no two human beings are uh, identical. We differ radically in temperaments, endowments, and experiences. We are, each of us, unique and our response to the changes and challenges of life are distinctive and different. Yet, by and large, as we move through time, we discover that growing old is a constrictive process. It's a process that confronts us with a common problem, and that problem is set forth suggestively by Robert Frost in his poem, The Oven Bird. That feathery creature is perched on a stone wall in New England. Summer is past and autumn is now rapidly moving into winter. Before long, freezing weather will set in and the world will be blanketed with snow. And yet the oven bird is singing gallantly, Frost writes, as if to make the most of a diminished thing. And that's the problem we confront as we age. How can we make the most of a diminished thing? Think with me then about the ways life is diminishing. For one thing, it is diminishing temporally. We have less and less time in this world. With David, Israel's poet king, we exclaim, teach us to number our days that we may apply our hearts uh, unto wisdom. Life is also diminishing physically. Exercise and diet as we may, our energy is less and less, and our strength is gradually ebbing away. We can't walk as fast and as far as we did earlier on. The tasks we once performed with the greatest of ease may now be laborious struggles. Moreover, for many of us, life is diminishing spatially. We have sold the sizable houses in which we formerly lived and moved into an apartment or a retirement community. We may be consigned to a room in the home of our children. Once we may have traveled widely, but now perhaps we are confined to a wheelchair or, or a bed. We can't drive or move about as we did so freely in years gone by. Add to all of this shrinking process the sad truth that life is diminishing 
vocationally. In our society, we reach a certain year in our journey, usually 60 or, or 70, when we are expected to give up our professions and jobs. E even simple tasks may be relinquished. I think of my mother-in-law, who lived with us for a quarter of a century following the death of her husband. She had enjoyed being a homemaker and insisted on keeping busy when she moved in with our family. At that time, how primitive, we had no dishwasher. So one of her self-assigned tasks was to do the dishes. And yet as she was increasingly unable to see clearly and to grasp things firmly, she was even relieved of that assignment, much to her distress. Again, for many of us, there is a diminishing financially. We may not have as much money as we once earned or controlled. Indeed, we may be eking out our existence on social security and all too meager, all too uncertain investments. Finally, and I apologize for this dismal recital, life is diminishing relationally. Neighbors, friends, colleagues, family members are far removed or have preceded us in death. One by one, our human ties are being cut. The, the circle of known and loved people is constricting. What I've been saying about life as a diminishing process may strike you as being excessively melancholy. And uh, I must emphasize that these specific kinds of constriction don't apply to everyone. Bear in mind, as I have pointed out, that we are all different, and thus our experiences will differ as we age. Nevertheless, we have, I must repeat, a common problem. H how can we best handle this constrictive process? What will enable us to make the most of our diminishing days? What will, yes, help us do that? I, I suggest that we can determine with God's enablement how the autumn and winter years of our lives are going to be spent. We, we can simply refuse to let circumstances control our attitude. And an attitude in the whole sweep of our experience, but especially in older age, is the crucial factor. Viktor Frankl, the well-known Austrian psychiatrist, was sent to a concentration camp when the Nazis took over his homeland. The situation in which he found himself was, was, was worse than deplorable. It was uh, purgatorial. Many of Frankel's fellow prisoners succumbed to despair and even to death. But, but Frankel observed that if anyone had a hope for the future, a, a reason to struggle on, he was likely to survive. Thus, in the book he composed while a prisoner, man's search for meaning, he argues that there are varieties of values and a person can resolutely choose to hold fast to self-chosen values. There are, he says, experiential values. We can experience activities and things that give us pleasure whether food and drink, married love, a beautiful sunset, magnificent music, any and all of the enriching joys of life. 
But, but what if we are in a situation where there is no opportunity to relish a delicious dinner or, or feel delightful sensations? What, in short, if we are robbed of all opportunities for experiential values? In the same way, what if there is no opportunity to produce any creative values? And these are not simply the higher reaches of culture like art and literature. Creativity can be exercised in the making of an apple pie, the, the carving of a piece of wood, the furnishing of a home, the upbringing of a family. But Suppose creative values are impossible. What then? Frankel argues there is always the process of a that there is always rather the possibility uh, of achieving attitudinal values. We can, as was done by some of his fellow inmates in the concentration camp, decide whether we will succumb to, to despair, give up any hope for the future, degenerate into mere zombies, or we can will, he contends, to be brave and cheerful and helpful and prayerful and patient. Frankel reached that conclusion as the fruit of his almost intolerable imprisonment. Chuck Swindoll, the well-known American preacher, has reached the same conclusion from his study and observation. He has this to say about attitude. The longer I live, the more I realize the importance of attitude on life. It is more important than the past, than education, than money, than circumstances, than failures, than successes, than what other people think or say or do. It is more important than appearance, giftedness, or skill. It will make or break a company, a church, a home. The remarkable thing is we have a choice every day regarding the attitude we will embrace for that day. We cannot change our past. We cannot change the fact that people will act in a certain way. We cannot change the inevitable. The only thing we can do is play on the one string we have, and that is our attitude. I am convinced, he continues, that life is 10% what happens to me and 90% how I react to it. And so it is with you. We are in charge of our attitudes. Now, that may sound like baptized so stoicism, but uh, it can rather be viewed as the appropriation of divine grace by the Holy Spirit's enablement. To face the inevitable process of aging with courage, confidence, and even cheerfulness, we need a vital faith. Yes, a vital faith. Not some religion which, as philosopher William James put it, is merely a, a dull habit. No, we, we need a vital faith which provides sustaining resources. And I speak now as an octogenarian who is convinced that the gospel of Jesus Christ is precisely such a faith. It provides, first of all, the comfort of an abiding presence. We may lose family members and friends. We may be living alone. Human companionship may be limited. And yet the gospel assures us we are not alone. We are not abandoned and forsaken. In God, we have the friend who sticks closer than a brother. At this stage of life, 
some of the great biblical texts can become more meaningful to us. One is Deuteronomy 31.6, be strong and courageous. Do not be afraid or terrified, for the Lord your God goes with you. He will never leave you nor forsake you. Another such text is Matthew 28.20, surely I will be with you always to the very end of the age. Hebrews 13.5 is a third antidote to depressive loneliness. God has said, never will I leave you, nor will I forsake you. Indeed, the aging process can be the translation of those texts from mere verbiage into a sustaining experience, the diminishing of flesh and blood relationships can stimulate the development of a deepening friendship with that invisible companion whose name is Emmanuel, God with us. Now, before I proceed any further, let me insert an explanatory comment. A vital Christian faith can greatly enrich the experience of older people, yes. Many, if not most of those we endeavor to help are believers in the gospel, once active in church affairs, knowledgeable about biblical doctrine, some even theologically educated. But whether strongly religious or only superficially God-oriented, they, they need to have doctrine become emotionally meaningful. My wife and I conduct a late Sunday afternoon service at the facility for older people where we live. Those attending are, by and large, education, many of them ex-professionals. Yet when we started this ministry more than a decade ago, I, a seminary professor, quickly realized that, that central concepts must be so interpreted as to become personally meaningful. Truth must be communicated with graspable simplicity and illuminating vividness. Consider then the point I have been making. A Christian faith provides a sense of divine presence. Actually, therefore, I am referring to the doctrine of divine omnipresence as taught, for example, in Psalm 139. But, but, but how do I make the reality of God's perversive, pervasive presence personally meaningful? Well, here's a story of graspable simplicity. A bedridden man was alone in his room at the nursing home except for the necessary visits of his caretakers and a weekly visit by his daughter. When he complained to her of his loneliness, she reminded him that as a Christian, he believed Jesus has promised to be with those who trust him always and everywhere. Yes, he did believe that. Yet it was hard to feel any comforting presence. So his daughter suggested that they put a chair alongside his bed and he could imagine Jesus sitting there and he could talk with him day or night. He could even put his hand on, on that chair and know he was touching Jesus. That, that simple technique proved a significant help in making the truth of divine omnipresence meaningful to him. In fact, when the nurse entered his room after he had quietly died, his outstretched hand was resting on that chair. Our problem then in, in ministering to people in general 
but I've found in ministering especially to older people is this, how can the truth be concretized? Not by the use of theological jargon, I can assure you, but depending, of course, on the individual's background, by expressing truth with graspable simplicity and illuminating vividness. For another thing, a vital Christian faith provides the awareness of an unchanging self-worth. From a purely human perspective, the diminishing process may reduce us to unproductive drones, no longer contributing anything to the general welfare. We may become shriveled organisms who have lost their charm and vitality. We may be costly burdens to our families and society. Yet from a faith perspective, our self-worth is as high as ever. For what is it that gives us value, even an inestimable value? It is the basic biblical affirmation that we bear the image of God, whether vibrantly young or helplessly old. Turn to the Gospel of Matthew, for example, and learn from Jesus Christ that as God's image bearers, we possess a self-worth age cannot diminish. What, what does our Savior teach in chapter 6, verses 28 through 30? Why do you worry about clothes? See how the lilies of the field grow. They do not labor or spin, yet I tell them that not even Solomon, I tell you that not even Solomon in all his splendor was dressed like one of these. If that is how God clothes the grass of the field, which is here today and tomorrow is thrown into the fire, will he not much more clothe you, O oh, you of little faith? What is Jesus saying? We have a value that exceeds the value of flowers, and, and that value never diminishes. Chemically, we may be worth at best only a few dollars. By contrast, there are beautiful orchids which command a price higher than our market value, yet our worth exceeds that of the most rare and exquisite of flowers because we are made in the image of God. In that same sixth chapter of Matthew, verse 26, Jesus urges us to consider another aspect of nature. Look at the birds of the air. They do not sow or reap or store away in barns, and yet your heavenly Father feeds them. Are you not much more valuable than they? Again in chapter 10, Verses 29 through 31, Jesus emphasizes our value as over against that of the birds. Are not two sparrows sold for a penny? Yet not one of them will fall to the ground apart from the will of your Father. And even the very hairs of your head are all numbered, so don't be afraid. You are worth more than many sparrows. Sparrows may be next to worthless, but there are gorgeous birds in our pet stores which command a fabulous, fabulous price. Yet, yet Jesus insists we are measurelessly more valuable than the most exotic feathered creature because we are God's image bearers and they are merely his creatures. Our Savior's estimate of any person's unchanging value is brought out further in Matthew 12, 12. How much more valuable is a man than a sheep? We certainly aren't worth as much as most animals, especially those, those lumbering champion steers sold annually at our national stock show in Denver. Such a steer may be auctioned for over $60,000. But we, no matter how frail, are valued at an incomparably higher level by God because 
we bear his image. And climactically, in Matthew chapter 16, verse 26, our Lord offers an incredible estimation of, of our worth. What shall it profit a man if he were to gain the, the whole world and lose his soul? Which means that, that the value of one human being is greater than whatever might be the value of the entire world and all that's in it. Thus, regardless of how shriveled and useless we may become, we have, from God's viewpoint, an undiminished value. A nameless woman in an English home for the aged expressed her emotions in a poem which was found in her meager possessions after she died, entitled, Lord, Open Their Eyes. It brings out poignantly our common need to be appreciated with understanding and dignity because of our unique selfhood. What do you see, nurse? What do you see? What are you thinking when you look at me? A, a crabbed old woman, not very wise, uncertain of habit with faraway eyes, who dribbles her food and makes no reply when you say in a loud voice, I do wish you'd try, who seems not to notice the things that you do and forever is losing a stocking or shoe, who, resisting or not, let you do as you will with bathing and feeding the long day to fill. Is that what you're thinking? Is that what you see? Then open your eyes, nurse. You're not looking at me. I'll tell you who I am as I sit here so still, as I move at your bidding, eat at your will. I'm a small child of 10 with a father and mother, brothers and sisters who love one another. A young girl of 16 with wings on her feet, dreaming that soon her lover she'll meet. A bride at 20, my heart gives a leap remembering the promises, I, the vows I promise to keep. At age 25, I have young of my own who need me to build a secure, happy home. A woman of 30, my children grow fast, bound together with ties that I'm hoping will last. At 40, my young sons have grown up and gone, but my man's still beside me to see I don't mourn at 50. Once more babies play round my knee, again we know children, my loved one and me. Dark days are upon me, my husband is dead. I, I look at the future, I shudder with dread, for my children are rearing young of their own, and I think of the years and the love that I've known. I'm an old woman now, and nature is cruel. Tis her just, just to make old age look like a fool. The worn body crumbles, grace and vigor depart. There now is a stone where I once had a heart. But, but inside this carcass, a young girl still dwells and now and again my embittered heart swells. I remember the joys I remember the pain, and I'm loving and living life over again. I think of the years all too few, gone too fast, and accept the stark fact that nothing can last. So open your eyes, nurse. Open and see. Not a crabbed old woman. Look closer. See me. What Christian faith enables our caregivers to see as a person who, as God's image bearer, has an inestimable value, no matter how old or infirm we may be. And Christian faith can enable us to see ourselves from, from this perspective, not a mere collection of atoms, as philosopher Bertrand Russell wrote, 
but a person entitled to dignity and self-respect because of bearing the image of God. What else can our Christian faith provide to sustain us through the constrictive process? I think realistically, it offers opportunities of continued usefulness. Let me hastily call attention to some of the inspiring and challenging examples of how even in old age, individuals have remained remarkably active and productive. I mention these human beings without any concern for their religious beliefs. They, they illustrate the potential that some members of the geriatric set possess. Oliver Wendell Holmes served on the United States Supreme Court until he was 91. Winston Churchill became Prime Minister of Britain for the second time at the age of 77. Grandma Moses began painting at the age of 75 and produced her most famous canvas, Christmas Eve, when she was 100. Robert Frost, one of America's best known poets, continued to write and lecture until his 85th year. Michelangelo reached the, the, the peak of, of his genius in his 80s when he chiseled his famous Pieta and, and constructed the dome of St. Peter's Cathedral. And these are only a, a few of the similar instances which demonstrate that oncoming age does not necessarily mean and inability to be active and creative. Moving into the sphere of Christian faith, consider this striking example of what can be done as one ages. Paul Brand, the famous missionary doctor, in the book which he co-authored with Philip Yancey, fearfully and wonderfully made, tells about his mother. She came from an elegant home in suburban London and, and went to India as a missionary all her life. He says when Granny Brand reached 69, she, she was told by her mission to retire, and, and she did, uh, until she found a new range of mountains where no missionary had ever visited. Without mission, and mission society support, she climbed those mountains built a little wooden shack and worked another 26 years. Because of a broken hip and creeping paralysis, she could only walk with the aid of two bamboo sticks. But on the back of an old horse, she rode all over the mountains, uh, a medicine box strapped behind her. She sought out the unwanted and the unlovely, the sick, the maimed, and the blind, and brought treatment to them. When she came to a settlement who knew her, a, a great crowd of people would burst out to greet her. My mother died at the age of 95. Poor nutrition and failing health had swollen her joints and made her gaunt and fragile. She had even stopped caring about her personal appearance long ago, refusing to look in a mirror lest she see the effects of her grueling life. She was part of the advance guard, the front line presenting God's love to deprived people. Now, inspiring and challenging as such a life undoubtedly is, it may leave older people of lesser ability and tenacity feeling worthless. They, they simply cannot exhibit such heroism or match such exploits. But, but a, a vital Christian faith enables even garden variety seniors to embrace personally what is said in Psalm 92, 14. They will bear fruit in old age. They will stay fresh and green. Even though they think of themselves as ungifted, older disciples can carry on helpful ministries. For one thing, no matter how limited they are, they can pray. 
They, they can be like Anna of whom we read in the second chapter of Luke. She was very old. She never left the temple but worshiped day and night, fasting and praying, confined to a bed or a chair. An intercessor is still able to reach heaven through prayer. There's also the opportunity for a ministry of witness without becoming a loquacious bore. An older person can testify of God's faithfulness through the years of life. That's the message of Psalm 71. The older generation can pass on to the next generation. Grandparents sharing with grandchildren the stories of what God has done even in uneventful lives. I omit that, you can, I hope, sometime look up Psalm 71. David realized the possibility of transgenerational witness, and that possibility can be actualized by today's seniors. Perhaps a grandparent's congregation is one small grandchild, but how important it is that the upcoming generations hear about the spiritual experience of the older generations. In addition, what about a ministry of informal teaching? There, there need not be a repetitious sermonizing, but why not a casual yet purposeful sharing of insight? After all, in the book of Job we read, is not wisdom found among the aged, does not long life bring understanding? And scripture shows us how, how the transmission of truth can take place. Listen to 2 Timothy chapter 1, verse 5. I am reminded of your sincere faith, a faith that dwelt first in your grandmother Lois and your mother Eunice, and now I am sure dwells in you. And further, in that same second letter, Paul urges Timothy to remember from whom he has learned spiritual truth and how from, an, from infancy he has known the Holy Scriptures. Grandparents don't need a theological degree in order to impart the, this basic knowledge to their grandchildren. And of course, there can be a ministry of helpfulness, those simple acts of kindness which can be performed regardless of limitation and infirmity. All of us, especially as we age, need to remember that Jesus applauds those who do nothing more than give a cup of cold water in his name. And finally, there is the ministry of modeling. We can be examples of authentic spirituality, exhibiting steadfast faith, patience, and love. The unwavering trust of an aged Christian proves the truthfulness of God's promise in Isaiah chapter 46. Even to your old age and gray hairs, I am he. I will sustain you. I have made you and I will carry you. I will sustain you and, and rescue you. As June Masters Batcher urges, it, it is good to pause and count our blessings at every birthday. They, they pile up with the years. God is changeless. He has work for each of us here. And every milestone shows that he chose to have us remain to give him a hand. Is there anything more that a vital Christian faith can provide as we move on inexorably towards the end of our, of our journey. In, indeed, there is. It can push back the confining walls of time and open up the vista of a limitless eternity. Now, death, of course, may overtake any one of us at any stage of our experience by illness, accident, violence, or even suicide. But uh, assuming that an individual is gradually deteriorating with the passage of time, certain aspects of life's termination may cause emotional stress. Th there may be haunting thoughts of 
death's inevitability, as Hebrews 9.27 puts it, just as man is destined to die once and after that the judgment, the inevitability of death means we are facing an appointment which cannot be canceled. Besides its inevitability, there's the unpredictability of death. Even in lingering illness, the hour of departure cannot be predicted with certainty. As we are told in Ecclesiastes 9.12, no man knows when his hour will come. Then to accompanying the dying process will sometimes be almost always is indignity as an individual is helplessly unable to care for himself. And beyond all this, there looms the, the factor of finality, the, the impossibility of any further possibility, as the existentialists like to put it. Uh, unfinished projects, unhealed relationships, unforgiven hurts, unlived life, uh, all of these may add to the emotional pressure of an, indivi an individual is undergoing. And, and, and what about the mystery of death? What really happens as we expire? Is there a prolonged passage between this world and the next, or is there an instantaneous transition? And what awaits us? Depending on our theology, we will enter into oblivion, purgatory, judgment, or glory. A vital Christian faith, however, while it does not eliminate all mystery, does provide a certainty. As that remarkable English woman, one time missionary to Africa, Frances Alshorn, said to a friend who had asked her about apprehensions of the dark, I can never see why one should fear to die. When I walk into the garden here early in the morning and nearly burst with excitement at this world, and, and when I realize it is only a shadow, a pale ghost of that world, what it must be like, then I can only feel a tremendous longing to know more of it and be in it. That's what a vital Christian faith can provide. Certainty with I confess, a sort of sanctified curiosity. Belief in the reality of our Savior's resurrection doesn't for everyone banish all the mystery and gloom of dying and death, but from that empty tomb of Jesus a radiant light shines forth as earthly horizons contract, as life becomes more and more uh, a diminished thing O opening up before the Christian are the immeasurable horizons of eternity. So in place of anxiety and despair, believers can rejoice with John Roberts that in the ultimate sense we are not growing old. What he wrote isn't a distinguished contribution to literature but it expresses the sustaining confidence that we can have and, and, and communicate through faith in the gospel. They tell me that I'm growing old. I've heard them tell at times untold. Yes, this frail shell in which I dwell is growing old, I, I know full well. What if my hair is turning gray? Gray hair is honorable, they say. What if my eyesight's growing dim, I still can see to follow him who sacrificed his life for me upon the cross of Calvary? Why should I care if time's rough plow has left its furrows on my brow? Another house not made with hands awaits me in the glory land. What, what though I falter in my walk? What though my tongue refuse to talk? I still can tread the narrow way. I still can trust and praise and pray. My hearing now is not as keen as in the past it may have been. Still, I can hear my Savior say and whisper soft, this is the way. My earthly frame 
do what I can to lengthen out this life's short span, shall perish and retain, return to dust as everything in nature must. But in my soul, I'm glad to say, my, my faith grows stronger every day. Then how can I be getting old when safe within my Savior's fold? And soon my soul shall fly away and leave its tenement of clay. This robe of flesh I'll drop and rise to seize the everlasting prize. I'll meet you on the streets of gold and prove that I'm not growing old. I'll join the song through ages sung, and there I'll be forever young. Let's be glad that profound truth, simply stated, is what people need as they pass through the experience of aging. In this conference, the constrictive process which makes life a diminished thing will no doubt be discussed from any number of weighty theological, psychological, scientific, and philosophical perspectives, all of which have their own indubitable importance. But I'm thankful at the outset of these days we can, as Christians, affirm the unique values which our faith provides.